and Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities and we're pleased to bring you these weekly Medical Center Hours. Today's program is called The Political Science of Psychiatric Diagnosis, A Moral Defense of the DSM. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, known as the DSM, is perhaps the most contested document in American medicine, vital for the organization and funding of psychiatric research and mental health care, yet perennially criticized, both from within and beyond the mental health community. Particularly heated debate accompanied the 2013 publication of the manual's fifth edition, DSM-5, when disputes erupted not just within, a med within medical arenas, but also during the public comment period, in public forums, in the press, um, involving patient advocacy groups, um, there was a lot of controversy everywhere. Some of the contested revisions dealt with sensitive situations, like normal grieving and questions around its pharmacologic management, and conditions that were much in the social spotlight, like autism spectrum disorder. And um, even the lead editor of DSM-4 got into the fray, publishing fierce criticisms of DSM-5. Now, critics charge that Edition 5 disguises as science the political interests and agendas of psychiatrists and pharmaceutical manufacturers at patients' expenses. expense. DSM-5 defenders, meanwhile, champion the new manual's inclusiveness, its evidence base, and the transparency of its review process. But if we take a longer historical view, this latest DSM and attendant arguments betray what is an important and quite fascinating fact, often obscured in the recent debate and lost amid coding for diagnoses and billing for mental health services. And that fact is this. The DSM is a social document, an evolving mirror of medical scientific knowledge and a revealing record of social assumptions and attitudes. The DSM says a lot about who we are and how we think about, classify, and try to help one another. In this Medical Center Hour, psychiatrist and theologian Warren Kinghorn discusses the latest debates and argues for a mediating alternative that the DSM may be best understood as a working document of a living moral tradition, in this case, the moral tradition of American psychiatry. Warren Kinghorn is assistant professor of psychiatry and pastoral and moral theology at Duke University, where he is jointly appointed in the Medical Center and the Divinity School. Given the charged nature of conversations about the DSM, we look forward not only to Dr. Kinghorn's analysis, but also to your questions and comments. Um, our program today is co-presented with the history of the Health Sciences Lecture Series. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Warren Kinghorn. Thank you, Dr. Childress, and thank you for all of you for being here. It's wonderful to be back in the space and in Charlottesville. Uh, I uh, am not very far down the road in Durham, and I feel like I owe a debt to you all here, um, your faculty, I've used your works in my teaching at Duke, I think especially of Margaret Mormon and religious studies in that regard. Um, I carried around a textbook that was single authored by a UVA uh, psychiatry attending, Bruce Cohen, for most of my residency until my shoulder hurt. <laughs> oh, oh, very good, excellent. <laughs> I, I'm definitely honored to be here. And, and I also, um, and, uh, and it's, it's got the coffee stains to prove it, actually. And uh, I, uh, I also was befriended at an early point as an undergraduate pre-med student in, in South Carolina by your former chair of family medicine, Louis Barnett, who uh, taught me much about what it meant to be a good physician at a time uh, when I was needed to hear that and understand that. And, and he set a, an example that I continue to try to live into at my best. So I appreciate uh, that and you all for that reason. Uh, I also am glad to be at a real basketball school. <laughs> <laughs> Top the ACC. I'm not sure you know, how, to, how, to, how to psychologically deal with that as a you know, person. That's right. I want to start uh, today with uh, two case studies. But I've I titled my talk, The Political Science of Psychiatric Diagnosis, A Moral Defense of the DSM. 
And I could have, I, I was going back and forth on the title that I wanted to use, because I almost titled it uh, A Moral Critique of the DSM. But I thought, you know, critiques of the DSM are actually pretty easy to make. They're kind of a dime a dozen. You hear them a lot. So it's actually much harder to give a defense than to give a critique. And so I actually want you to hear what I say today as a defense, although it might seem at times to be a kind of critical defense. I, I do think it's important to make disclosures given the nature of the talk. I don't have any relationship with any commercial entities, either publishing or uh, pharmaceutical or of any other sort. I didn't have any affiliation with the DSM-5 revision process, so I don't speak for uh, that, that, that process. I'm a member of the American Psychiatric Association, but I in no way speak for the organization or any other professional organization. Here are two case studies that I'll present now, and then we'll come back to toward the end of the talk. The first is Thomas. Thomas is a 32-year-old lawyer who presents for psychiatric care, stating that he feels like the most miserable person on the earth, and that he'd rather die than continue to live as he's feeling. Although he's been able to continue working, barely, his sleep and appetite have been poor, and he's been losing weight. He admits that he's thought frequently of suicide for years, even on one occasion writing a suicide note, though denies any current suicide plan or intent. He's preoccupied by feelings of regret and loneliness. Current stresses include a sense of disconnection from his wife, from whom he feels emotionally distant, the demands of running a small town law practice, and a long and cold winter, which he generally feels makes his mood worse. He has not been drinking alcohol, but did use cocaine once to medicate himself, though denies doing so presently. He says that he decided to seek care after friends became so concerned about him that they removed knives and razors, as well as firearms, from his home. He states that he's never been hospitalized or previously sought psychiatric treatment, but that he felt very similarly six years earlier when he was 26, after the sudden death of a close female friend. At that time also, he'd been preoccupied by thoughts of suicide, but had never attempted to harm himself. Our second patient is named John. John is a 22-year-old combat veteran who presents to a primary care physician at the urging of his concerned father. He says that he's haunted by memories of a battle during a recent combat deployment in which many of the men under his command were killed or injured, and that he himself was captured and taken as a prisoner of war. Though he doesn't give details of his experience as a POW, he says that it was brutal. He's now separated from the military and back in his hometown, but finds it intolerable. He feels constantly on edge and is tormented by recurring thoughts of combat. He also feels lost and, and angry. Angry at those, including his father, who supported the war in its early days, and yet now can't seem to listen to the brutal reality of his experience. Angry at those who expect him to be the same as he had been before war, as if that were possible. He says that he would not be coming for care were it not for his father, who's noticed his insomnia, his erratic sleep patterns, his habit of leaving the house at night and walking the streets, and even of leaving home for a couple of days at a time and sleeping in abandoned buildings when he wants to be alone. He's thinking even of returning to combat with the idea that at least he knows who he is as a soldier. As a civilian, he's not so sure. Now, if these two folks were to present, I don't know about the University of Virginia Medical Center, but if these folks were to present to Duke or to the Durham VA where I work, I'm pretty sure what would happen in general. Uh, in the case of Thomas, the, the young depressed lawyer, uh, there'd be a detailed conversation about a suicide risk. Uh, detailed conversation about whether he needs to be hospitalized. Uh, he'd either be hospitalized for a short term or, or, or discharged with a really good safety plan. He would likely, in one of his first encounters, be offered an antidepressant medication, and he would likely be referred to a clinic where he would be offered talk therapy, for instance, our cognitive behavioral therapy program. And he would almost certainly be diagnosed with major depressive disorder recurrent. John, on the other hand, if he presented to the Durham VA, would almost certainly, given a few extra questions, be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. He would be given a referral to our Iraq Afghanistan Mental Health Clinic. He would be offered, eventually, once he was ready for it, uh, some uh, treatments that are specialized for combat-related PTSD, like prolonged exposure therapy, cognitive processing therapy. He would almost certainly be offered a serotonin-specific reuptake inhibitor, like paroxetine or sertraline, and uh, would be would be invited to continue treatment. And both of them, were they to present in these ways, if they are like most people in these situations, would, as a result of those multi multimodal treatments, get better. They would feel better gradually over time. Wouldn't be any quick fixes, but they would 
gradually begin to feel better, they'd be in less pain, they'd be a bit happier, they'd be better able to go on with the demands of life. And that's, in many ways, a good thing, and one that, as a psychiatrist, I'm proud of. The kind of language that enables those kinds of plans for Thomas and John come out of this document uh, called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which many of you are intimately associated with because you're clinicians, and most of you know something about, published in its fifth edition in 2013. Some have called, not the DSM itself, but some have referred to the DSM as a psychiatric Bible, which uh, conveys a certain interesting uh, naivete maybe about the Bible itself. Uh, but when it's called a psychiatric Bible, it's, uh, it's generally thought of as a kind of authoritative text of psychiatry that governs, sets the tone of language, governs diagnosis, governs insurance coding, governs reimbursements, and for the last 35 years has governed the way that psychiatric research, clinical research, is organized along diagnostic lines. And in that sense, it does serve as a kind of authoritative text in that way. The DSM is important. The DSM has not always been as important as uh, it is now, uh, but it does have an interesting history. DSM-1, the first edition of the DSM, emerged in 1952 to meet the specific needs of returning veterans, largely, who were seeking outpatient psychiatric care. And the American psychiatry at the time was heavily oriented toward the care of inpatients in large inpatient facilities. It didn't have the kind of language to, to handle a, a large uh, number of outpatients that were presenting. And so developed this very small document uh, to, as a kind of coding manual. It was heavily based on the, uh, the work of Adolf Meyer. Uh, that was revised in 1968 into the second edition of the DSM. And I brought one of Duke's copies, uh, if you want to look at it afterward. Uh, it's a very small book. There's not much to it. You know, it's mainly just a list of diagnoses and a couple, few, some paragraph-length um, descriptions, uh, but nothing like what you see now. And these were not particularly important documents within American psychiatry at the time. They were there, but they didn't really govern how psychiatry worked in its practice. But that changed in the 1970s. In the 1970s, there were a number of social developments and developments within psychiatry itself, which led to a sense that psychiatry as a medical specialty was in trouble. Uh, there were a number of different things, uh, one of which was the anti-psychiatry movement that was uh, most prominently associated in the United States with Thomas Saz and his book, The Myth of Mental Illness. Uh, and libertarian critiques that psychiatry just masked various kinds of social power. There were a number of, exper uh, of clinical studies that looked at the reliability, especially the cross-cultural reliability of psychiatric diagnosis. It turned out that psychiatrists in the United States were more likely to diagnose schizophrenia when psychiatrists in the UK were more likely to diagnose manic depression, given similar descriptions. Uh, there was an embarrassing publication in Science in 1973 where uh, a bunch of pseudo patients ended up in 12 different psychiatric hospitals in the United States, falsely claiming that they had heard words like thud. They were admitted to the hospital. They were then instructed, as part of this study, to deny all symptoms once they were admitted and act normally. But they still stayed in the hospital for an average of 19 days. Most of them were discharged with diagnosis of schizophrenia and remission. And in a time in the, in the culture where there was a lot of increasing attention to civil liberties and to abuses of medical power, this didn't go over well. It didn't make psychiatry look particularly good. And then most um, pointedly, there was the very public debate about the status of homosexuality as a diagnosis in DSM-2 that resulted in the removal of homosexuality from the DSM in 1973. All of this gave rise to a lot of unease about diagnosis within American psychiatry at the time. And so there was a task force that was constituted. And uh, Robert Spitzer uh, was appointed the chair of it to revision the way that psychiatric diagnosis was understood. And the fruit of that in 1980 was this green uh, volume above the DSM-3. DSM-3 was, in many ways, the DSM that we have now. Uh, it, uh, for the first time, focused on principles of operationalism. And with that came the criteria sets that are known to any of you who use DSM now. So a certain no number of criteria that you have to meet, uh, say five out of nine depressive criteria for a certain time course, uh, and with certain ex other qualifying criteria to meet uh, the diagnosis. And that if you satisfied these criteria, you were stipulated to have a particular diagnosis like major depressive disorder. DSM-3 also introduced certain language. Uh, so the, lang the, the words post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder came to us uh, largely through DSM-3, at least in their, in their, in, in their more modern forms. Uh, DSM-3 focused not on the validity of diagnosis, because it was understood that validity of diagnosis, naming things that were out there in nature, was not within the reach of diagnosis at the time, but rather on the development of reliable constructs, where different people trained in different places, maybe even in different theoretical schools, could see similar patients and respond in similar ways. 
to, uh, to at least use the same kind of language. The idea was that if you have reliable diagnostic constructs, then they'll become increasingly valid over time as uh, biological researchers and clinical researchers fill in the, the gaps that were there. And the DSM-3 strove to be, quote, atheoretical with respect to, with respect to etiology, to not speculate on exactly how mental disorders are caused, but just on how they manifest. So you had phenomenological descriptions of diagnosis. And for all of the debate after that, all of the subsequent editions of DSM, DSM-3R, DSM-4, DSM-4TR, and now DSM-5, are in many ways modifications, and sometimes fairly minor modifications, of DSM-3. The DSM that we have is still very much DSM-3. So we might call DSM-3 and following collectively the DSM project, uh, DSM-3 and its modifications subsequently. Not to say that DSM-5, uh, which I've actually brought uh, my copy here, so uh, don't steal either Duke's copy of DSM-2 or my copy of DSM-5, you're welcome to look at it afterward. Um, DSM-5 was a pretty controversial process and played out heavily in the press. Uh, and it was about a 15-year process. The process started in uh, the late 1990s. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association, which has published all of the DSMs, uh, began to uh, actually gain a grant to do a series of planning conferences and white papers. 2006 to 2008, a task force was uh, created to uh, put the DSM uh, together. Things got very politically interesting in 2009 when uh, first Robert Spitzer, who was the architect of DSM-3, and then later Alan Francis, who was a former chair at Duke, who was the uh, architect of DSM-4, came out very publicly and quite vitriolically against the way that the DSM-5 revision process was taking shape. Spitzer was most concerned about what he perceived as secrecy of the process, not releasing minutes from the task force planning meetings. Uh, Francis joined in uh, in a bit sort of a higher uh, rhetorical tone, uh, not only complaining about secrecy, but also worried that the way that the process was set up was going to lead to expansions of medicalization of mental illness in ways that would have, have uh, diagnoses that would have applied to, to what we might call ordinary painful experience that would lead to inappropriate um, expansions of psychiatry's reach. And uh, Francis was very worried about certain proposals for diagnoses in DSM-5 as uh, medicalizing what either what shouldn't be properly within the range of the, of the medical. Come back to that in a little bit. Um, the, the APA leadership and the DSM-5 task force quickly uh, answered Francis back and Spitzer back with a very sharp uh, defense of the DSM-5 planning process, uh, calling it uh, the most open and inclusive process ever, uh, including more open than Francis' own uh, DSM-4, and, quote, scientific. And they actually finished the op-ed in which they revisited this with an ad hominem attack on Francis, saying that Francis was probably <coughs> motivated by his own desire to protect royalties from DSM-4-related publications and uh, therefore had a uh, motive to delay the publication of DSM-5. This didn't go over well with any uh, parts, and it kept lots of people busy, uh, on the, especially on the, the pages of a newsletter called Psychiatric Times. And that triggered really a rhetorical war, which only uh, quieted with the publication of DSM-5 in 2013. Uh, one of the, the, you could say, the results of, of that debate was the appointment of a scientific review committee chaired by Kenneth Kindler, who teaches right down the road at VCU in Richmond, which uh, was to report directly to the APA Board of Trustees as a way to provide a kind of secondary um, gauge for the DSM-5 revision process that wasn't part of the task force itself. So there were some additional review processes that were appointed. In the context of DSM-5, there were a number of different critiques that were posed to DSM-5, which also, in some cases, applied to DSM-4 and to DSM-3. Uh, this isn't meant to be comprehensive, but to give you an example of the kind of criticisms that have been launched against the DSM project itself. One is the concern about diagnostic inflation and what you might say the medicalization of ordinary life. Uh, Francis uh, has had made this a persistent criticism. Uh, in a more nuanced book, uh, Alan Horwitz and Jerome Wakefield uh, wrote a book called The Loss of Sadness, in which they charge basically that the DSM-3 construct of major depressive disorder brings together biologically mediated depression and uh, the kind of sadness that is a normal human response to uh, painful events and lumps it into one diagnostic category in ways that makes it hard to distinguish one from the other. It makes it hard to know exactly what we're talking about when we use the language of depression. Uh, another kind of critique is made by Carl Elliott and by many others that the DSM masks certain kinds of either professional or commercial interests. Elliott's written about the, the origin and development of social anxiety, social phobia. Uh, as really following the, de the development of uh, SSRIs to treat uh, shyness uh, and that 
Uh, pharmaceutical companies have learned that the way you can market a drug is to market the disease that the drug is there to treat. And uh, so many have, have traced this in different historical ways. Um, and others, including Francis, have argued that there's an inherent conflict of interest between the American Psychiatric Association, which is really an association like all medical professional organizations to defend the clinical turf and economic interests of, of American psychiatry, and hopefully also to serve the needs of patients that psychiatrists treat, uh, to then also be in charge of publishing the main diagnostic coding manual that then legitimates the use of psychiatric technology and psychiatric uh, uh, care. And, and some have uh, charged that that uh, creates some conflicts of interest. A, a separate track of criticism, which has come more from the, uh, from the scientific community, has been that DSM-3 actually hasn't lived up very well as a, as a research tool. It actually hasn't led to very, very uh, exemplary research successes in identifying the, the causal mechanisms of mental illness. Uh, the current uh, leader of the National Institute of Mental Health, Tom Insel, surprised uh, most people by putting on a blog the week the DSM was published that the NIMH would no longer organize its uh, research paradigms according to, to the DSM, DSM-5, which wasn't welcome news to those that had worked for 15 years on DSM-5. And uh, they had some conversations, and I think we've gotten that sorted out a bit. But that was, uh, that's a separate set of criticism. And then there's others that have charged that the DSM uh, uh, makes insufficient reference to environment and to social causation of mental illness and to social context in general. DSM-3 very pointedly uh, stipulates that mental disorders occur in an individual, therefore uh, making it much more difficult to think about mental disorders as existing in a culture or uh, in an interpersonal space. Uh, there's, there's less space for that in, in the DSM project than there had been previously. So the question then is, remains, why does this matter so much? Why does this document, this book, that's really just a, um, a medical coding text. Why does it engender so much energy and uh, debate and, uh, and stress and, and fear? What's going on in the DSM that gives it so much power? Uh, this is uh, where I want to shift now to thinking about how do we understand the DSM? What do we expect for it to be? And, uh, and I want to consider now the DSM in the light of a moral philosopher named Alastair McIntyre. Alistair McIntyre is a well-known moral philosopher in the United States and in Europe, uh, originally Scottish, who spent most of his career in the United States, who uh, now at the University of Notre Dame, who uh, has never written much about psychiatry, but has written a lot about ethics and the history of ethics. Uh, McIntyre is best known for two books that he wrote in the 1980s, After Virtue and Whose Justice, Which Rationality. In After Virtue, he famously argued that modern moral discourse has become increasingly shrill and fragmented that moral language had become separated from the cultural and philosophical context which originally gave it meaning and coherence. And he calls for the recovery of ethics as craft traditions emerging from the practices and languages of particular communities with particular understandings of the good. McIntyre is most interested in understanding what's happened to language of moral theory and moral philosophy in the context of the 19th and 20th centuries and leading on to the 21st. Now, it might seem a bit strange that in this talk here at the Medical Center, that I'd be bringing in this work around moral theory, moral philosophy, to think about what is, in a essence, a medical text. But I'd argue that this comparison is actually not quite as inept or not quite as distant as it might seem. Because, and this is where I think some of the answer is in terms of why the DSM matters. The DSM does function in our culture in, as a kind of moral document that in designating certain forms of experience and behavior as disorder, the DSM borrows, I would argue, without attribution, judgments from our culture about what a well-lived life looks like. The DSM doesn't uh, itself contain any account of how one ought to live or of exactly what the well-lived life looks like. Uh, and it's not that the people who create the DSM or use the DSM are intending to convey, there's no hidden agenda where they're intending to convey any particular account of how one ought to live. But in defining certain kinds of parameters, outside of which there's a license for medical technology and medical power to be used, then it's a way of conveying certain kinds of outer limits of the good life that therefore displays certain conceptions about how one ought to live. That's a very difficult claim to make within modern medicine since we try very hard not actually to make any categorical claims about how we ought to live. But the DSM does it by displaying certain limits, even without being able to name in any way the source of those limits. That's why I say it borrows without attribution. And 
this then leads to the question of how does the DSM do this, and and is is that an is that an appropriate expectation for the DSM, and does the DSM own that? And that that then gets uh, to this typology that McIntyre uh, <coughs> supplies in a book called Three Rival Versions of Moral Inquiry: Encyclopedia, Genealogy, and Tradition. This book was initially delivered as a set of Gifford lectures at the University of Edinburgh in 1988. It was published in 1990, and it's a typology. So it's intended to bring a kind of rational scheme for the analysis of a complex history. It needs to be understood as a typology. But the basic story that McIntyre tells is that encyclopedia is undercut, and I'll, I'll come back to this, encyclopedia is undercut by genealogy. And that tradition is McIntyre's constructive alternative to avoid the pretensions of encyclopedia and to avoid the corrosive effects of genealogy. He thinks of uh, what it would mean to think of, of moral claims as encyclopedic, of how those, moral, how those encyclopedic moral claims are undercut by what he calls genealogy, and then he frames tradition as a, a way to think apart uh, from either encyclopedia or genealogy in a way that makes more responsible use of moral claims. And I want to think about that specifically in relationship to the DSM. So let's get into McIntyre's typology of encyclopedia genealogy and tradition. The first uh, of the typology is encyclopedia. And for McIntyre, encyclopedia both refers to a particular text that's paradigmatic of what he means, and it also refers to a kind of approach to knowledge that he sees as characteristic of the Enlightenment in general and also of late 19th century uh, uh, philosophy uh, in, the, in the particular Scottish context in which he originally delivered these lectures. Uh, the particular text he referred to is the ninth edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, which I've given a picture of it right. You can pay a lot of money on eBay if you want to own one of your own. Uh, but the, the approach is what's more relevant for our context. Uh, Encyclopedia relies on a few assumptions about knowledge and how knowledge is gained and how it's constituted and how, 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 how the development of theory happens. McIntyre says that uh, Encyclopedia uh, says that first there are data that are, are facts that are open to examination that are, in theory, open to anyone to examine. That second, methodical analysis of the facts give rise to what McIntyre calls unifying synthetic conceptions, which so order the facts as to show them to be exemplifying more general laws. Third, uniform <coughs> methods are used to achieve these unifying synthetic conceptions. And fourth, there's the assumption that the systematic application of these methods to facts will result in continuous progress supplying increasingly comprehensive, unifying conceptions and fundamental laws. So the idea is that you start with facts that aren't interpreted, that you apply consistent method to those facts in order to gain unifying synthetic conceptions, that the continuous application of those consistent methods will eventually lead to the elucidation of, of, uh, of fundamental laws, which can then be recursively applied to the facts, and which can be compiled in a text, or at least a set of texts they can give a kind of comprehensive knowledge of, of truth. And that could be scientific truth, or in McIntyre's case, it could be truth about uh, the truths of morality as well. McIntyre saw that this was happening in some cases in, in the late 19th century. And uh, it specifically happens in, in certain parts of the Encyclopedia Britannica at the time, which traces from a more famous encyclopedia of Diderot in the context of the French Enlightenment. The question is, does the DSM actually act in this way as encyclopedia? Again, not thinking about uh, its the specific linkage to this tradition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, but, but does it think of knowledge in this way, or does it present itself in this way? And the answer is complex. The DSM doesn't actually uh, present itself as an encyclopedia in the way that I've described in, its, in, in the text itself. And, uh, and those who, who are most involved in the formation of the DSM don't actually uh, take care not to describe it in exactly this way. What I've described sounds a lot like inductive scientific method of a certain sort. Um, but there's, but DSM generally uh, backs off of those kinds of claims about itself as providing a kind of, of fundamental explication of the nature of mental disorder that are understood as, as essences. Um, and, that, um, and, that, and that DSM is a kind of, of, of result of that. Um, the DSM actually, in its fourth edition, has a helpful description of itself as a helpful guide to clinical practice, which is very different than, uh, than, than a kind of encyclopedic uh, understanding of itself. And yet, within the way the DSM is created, 
and within the way that it's received by its communities, by consumers, by the way that it's reported on in the press, there's often the assumption that the DSM project taken as a whole is progressing toward a kind of explication of the fundamental laws of mental disorder. That if we just keep on with the project, that we'll eventually get there. The platonic term to carve nature at its joints shows up over and over again in the documents that go along with the DSM-5 uh, and DSM planning processes. There's, there's, there, every, every time there's a new um, uh, effort to revise the DSM or a planning conference on the DSM, there's this aspiration that someday we'll have a psychiatric nosology classification which carves nature at its joints, somehow gets to the, the fundamental nature of how things are. And this shows up in, in different ways. Uh, one, one way that this shows up, and this is from a paper that was published this last fall by Kenneth Kendler, who writes with extraordinary philosophical sophistication as a clinician and also a, a very, very dead researcher, uh, and was the chair of the DSM-5 Scientific Review Committee. And he refers to uh, a, a different theory, but related in the philosophy of science, called epistemic iteration. And uh, offers that epistemic iteration is the answer for the DSM project as a whole. Kendler says, epistemic iteration, which he, uh, well, he says it should lead through successive stages of scientific research toward better and better approximations of reality in a spiral of improvement, each subsequent stage producing more accurate estimates than the stage that came before. I felt, and he's, he's actually writing a paper about the Scientific Review Committee, so he's writing the first person about the DSM-5 revision process. I felt, as the Review Committee Chair, that this model could be potentially, could be usefully applied to psychiatric nosology and represent a potential framework for the future of DSM. But how might we try to ensure that each edition of the DSM produce better and especially more valid diagnoses? The response would be to put all proposals through a rigorous scientific review. This vision for the Scientific Review Committee was supported by then APA President Dr. Carol Bernstein and the APA leadership. Now, Kindler knows about these debates. He's actually not making a, 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 an absolute claim that psychiatric disorders are, are essences. But, but he's, uh, he's embodying a kind of approach that maybe someday we'll get through an iterative process to uh, a, a kind of fully valid, this dream of a fully valid cl uh, psychiatric classification uh, that I would argue follows fairly closely, at least has a lot of resemblance to the approach to knowledge that McIntyre refers to as encyclopedia. There's a problem, though, with encyclopedia in McIntyre's analysis, and that is that it ran head on into Nietzsche and Foucault through the kind of approaches <coughs> to knowledge and to text that uh, especially Nietzsche presented in the late 19th century. Again, and McIntyre calls this genealogy, broadly. Again, for McIntyre, genealogy is both embodied in a particular text, in this case, Nietzsche's genealogy of morals, but it also represents a, a, a particular set of critiques that are made against texts and, and approaches to knowledge that take on this encyclopedic uh, stance or encyclopedic mentality. And there's four kinds of critiques. And rather than going through McIntyre's examples of how that's applied to moral theory, I want to actually describe how this shows up in the critiques of DSM. There's four different kinds of critiques that McIntyre uh, puts out. One is what he calls psychogenetic critique. Psychogenetic critiques argue that what is taken to be fixed and binding about truth is an unrecognized motivation serving an unacknowledged purpose, such as for Nietzsche, the, the will to power. It's basically saying people are motivated in ways that they don't fully understand and, and what they say is to be discounted by these unrecognized motivations. This is, you know, psychiatrists you know, know how to deal, you know, think about these kinds of things. And sometimes uh, this, these psychogenetic critiques are kind of crude, like that, um, you know, so-and-so involved in this review process is just a narcissist. That's kind of crude. But there are more, there are more, um, whether or not, whether or not, whether or not it's yeah, true, I don't know, but there are more sophisticated ways to think about the process uh, that, that also come through a psychogenetic critique. So, for example, Alan Francis and his arguments over the last several years about DSM-5 has argued that the way that the DSM-5 task forces were constituted, where successful professional uh, researchers working in, uh, in a certain area are asked to come together to suggest revisions to the document, uh, carries with it uh, a motivation to make changes to the document, because there's a lot of career uh, advancement potential if you have your voice imprinted on success of the DSM. There's not that much to gain by just reviewing things and thinking actually things are fine the way they are and leaving them as is. So there's a kind of, there's a kind of, of, of agenda to drive and maybe even to expand the reach of psychiatric diagnosis that might actually not be acknowledged by the researchers themselves. So people are excited about the areas that they work in and they want to you know, see their own work expanded more broadly. And, and this leads in general to a structural 
uh, expansion of the reach of the DSM in ways that Francis sees as, as problematic. The second kind of critique is epistemological critiques. Epistemological critiques argue that knowledge is always from somewhere. It's never from nowhere. It's always from a particular perspective. And so you see this, for example, in debates about what kinds of DSM disorders should be thought of as culture-bound and what shouldn't be. Should anorexia nervosa be understood as culture-bound? DSM-5 equivocates on that a little bit, but doesn't consider it that way. Um, or, for example, when Alan Young, uh, an anthropologist at McGill, writes about PTSD uh, in his book, The Harmony of Illusions, he, he challenges this idea that PTSD is a kind of, of thing that's always been out there in nature that we're finally now beginning to uncover uh, through uh, scientific method. He says, rather, PTSD is not timeless, nor does it possess an intrinsic unity. Rather, he says, PTSD is glued together by the practices, technologies, and narratives with which it is diagnosed, studied, treated, and represented, and by the various interests, institutions, and moral arguments that mobilize these efforts and resources. Third, there's a kind of critique that's a historical critique, and this is probably the most common kind of critique made against DSM, which is basically to say that, um, that, that the DSM conveys a particular history which contains within it certain kinds of power interests. And this is actually an easy critique to make because Spitzer and others, in writing about the DSM-3 process, basically say that's a, that is what was happening. American psychiatry was trying to make itself more uh, legitimate within the pantheon of American medicine. This was a way to do that. And so the interests of psychiatry very much tied up into the DSM-3 project especially. And you see this uh, in, uh, done in lots of different ways. And, and you can see in uh, ways that DSM changed through specific political negotiation. For example, uh, the decision not to call mental disorders medical disorders in DSM-3 because the American Psychological Association objected at the time. And then finally, this literary critique. Uh, that uh, for McIntyre is a certain kind of connotation about rejecting the literary argumentative forms of the time. But for DSM, it's basically people are, who are saying the whole, this whole categorical approach to diagnosis that relies on criteria sets is actually not what psychiatric knowing should be about to begin with. And you see this most often through those who have proposed narrative, for example, as an alternative to the way that uh, the diagnosis happens within the DSM. McIntyre says that the, the cumulative effect of these kinds of ge genealogical critiques undercut encyclopedia to the point where encyclopedia is no longer, uh, within moral philosophy or within moral theory, a, uh, a, a coherent alternative, and that it doesn't have the kind of, of social coherence that it, it, it did before. And that's why he says uh, moral language has become increasingly shrill in the late 20th century. Uh, and I'd argue that these genealogical critiques of DSM have had not quite the same effect on the DSM, but they have had a, a corrosive effect. We still use the DSM. Psychiatry needs the DSM. We can't imagine what it would be like to be without the DSM. But the fact that all these critiques are out there is, it leads to a kind of cynicism about the DSM and about what it's about. So trainees and medical students are taught the DSM, but often taught it by teachers who themselves don't really fully believe in what the DSM represents. So that cynicism about psychiatry's diagnostic system leads to cynicism about psychiatry as a whole. And I remember as a second year medical student being taught, my first introduction to psychiatry was at, in a very staid way, having to memorize DSM criteria and learn them and apply them and do a standard diagnostic interview. And it was honestly spelt to mind. I decided not to go into psychiatry when I, uh, when I had them. And fortunately, later came back to it, which was um, good. But I'm aware that uh, a lot of you who are in other specialties, that might be your, your first introduction to psychiatry. Um, but fortunately, that's not the only way that there is uh, to the DSM. If the DSM is understood as encyclopedia, then these genealogical critiques are devastatingly corrosive. So if, if we understand by what the DSM ought to be, a, a, a document which carves nature at its joints, which uses uniform scientific method to achieve the true nature of mental disorders, then these kinds of critiques are, are devastating and probably uh, non-recoverable for the DSM. But there's a different way of understanding the DSM, and that's McIntyre's understanding of tradition. McIntyre's understanding of tradition holds that moral theory, and you might say now psychiatric diagnosis, doesn't emerge from a vacuum. Nor does it emerge from an individual work of genius, nor from a small group of people, nor does it emerge from a disciplined application of scientific method alone. Rather, moral theory and moral inquiry, or we might say psychiatric diagnosis, always arises in the context of particular communities responding in particular ways to particular challenges across time. In tradition, as McIntyre understands it, there's no sharp distinction made between the content of a theory or ethic and the political context which gives rise to it, because all moral theory happens in the context of originating communities, and in some sense serves those originating communities, serves their needs. 
Nor is there a sharp distinction between fact and value, because facts are always reflective of the commitments of those that discern them and elucidate them and settle on them. McIntyre describes tradition in his book After Virtue as a historically extended, socially embodied argument. McIntyre says that traditions, and he has various historical examples, function in, in variable but, but roughly predictable ways. He says, first, there's a text or texts that are con uh, given certain kinds of authority. Uh, that might be also a person or a personal figure. Eventually, however, in a second stage, these authoritative texts and voices are put to the question, either by internal dissension or by changing circumstance, or by external uh, challenge. And when they're put to the test, then, they have to be uh, rectified, or the tradition will die. That, that authority will be discredited, and, and the tradition goes away. But a successful tradition finds ways to actually overcome those threats and challenges by finding a way to go on that both meets the need of the present situation, and acknowledges continuity between past and present, and provides an explanation for why the challenge was so difficult and to move forward. So one example, there's lots of ways you could describe this in psychiatry, but one way to think about this would be the evolution from Freud and Klein uh, to Bowlby and Ainsworth in the middle 20th century to now this robust the, uh, field of attachment, which certain psychoanalysts still trace as, as coherent within what Freud was doing, even though it's very different in many ways, having responded to different kind of challenges. Um, Tradition, it, traditions are, are always fluid and always contextual and always emerging from the needs of particular communities. McIntyre says that traditions uh, aren't just sort of abstract sets of knowledge. They, they emerge in the context, they develop institutions which are able to, to give rise to the kinds of conversation uh, in which knowledge can develop. They develop certain virtues or excellences, uh, both virtues of knowing, intellectual virtues, and virtues of acting, moral virtues. And they, as a third stage, develop theories as well that are themselves always embedded within the communities which give them rise. And tradition, in McIntyre's argument, is superior to both encyclopedia and genealogy. It's superior to encyclopedia because, unlike encyclopedia, it's open and forthright about the historical nature of moral reason, or what we might say diagnostic reasoning. Rather than defensively barricading or rejecting the past, the adherent of tradition invites the genealogist in to, to look around, to explore it, to discuss it. And so critiques, which, uh, which if, if in an encyclopedic context have to just be fended off, can be treated by someone in a, in a, uh, with an understanding of tradition as an invitation to explore, to, for, for greater self-knowledge of the community. And McIntyre says that tradition is superior to genealogy, because the problem with genealogy, McIntyre says, is that it's so corrosive it not only corrodes encyclopedia and corrodes the pretensions of encyclopedia, but ultimately the kind of critiques that are set forth here ultimately corrode even the self that asked the questions to begin with. So there's a, a lack of coherence of the self capable of posing the, 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 the questions. Mike says tradition, though, always has a way to account for the existence of a self because the self is always a part of a set of conversations, always emerging in a particular community, which gives the self meaning and, and a kind of basis for speech. So McIntyre sees tradition as a way to rescue moral theory from the corrosive effects of genealogy without the pretensions of the encyclopedia. And I see tradition as a way to think coherently about the DSM that honors what it does well and also avoids what it does poorly or the way it's poorly interpreted. What would a tradition constituted account of the DSM look like? And I put a, a, a picture here from what probably is the most interesting moment in the history of American psychiatric physics annual meetings, where uh, Dr. John Fryer in 1972 uh, disguised himself as Dr. H. Anonymous and described how difficult it was to be a gay psychiatrist at a time when the APA had homosexuality still in the DSM. Many people see this as the turning point that led to the removal of homosexuality from the DSM. In many ways, DSM understood as tradition could actually continue to be about what it is right now in practice. It could continue to understand itself as a helpful guide, or be understood as a helpful guide to clinical practice. It could continue to understand itself and to be understood as a reflection of the collective judgment of American psychiatry, or at least uh, dominant voices within American psychiatry, in a particular cultural and historical context. And it continued to understand itself validly and rightly as a scientific document, as a document with empirical support that, that gathers together. It's a kind of compendium of a huge uh, 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 body of, 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 uh, of empirical research. So it's an empirically supported document. And I think it can, it can still even strive to carve nature at its joints, that phrase that keeps coming up, with the understanding that nature itself is something that the definition of which emerges in the context of a particular community. 
So if you want to carve nature at its joints, especially if you think about human nature, you need to have some account of what human nature is that you're carving, which actually requires a community to discern to begin with. It's not something that's self-evident. But the DSM is not timeless, and it's not and never can be apolitical. It's always a political document. Foundational criticisms of the DSM can therefore be understood as internal, not external challenges, and therefore treated as such. So the charge, for example, that the American Psychiatric Association shouldn't be entrusted with the DSM because of inherent economic conflict of interest where the APA you know, relies on publication revenue from DSM and its, and its, um, and its sales, um, should prompt for a tradition constituted DSM project not uh, a way to explain it away, but a kind of non-defensive soul searching. What, what would it mean for us to think seriously about this as a potential professional conflict of interest? Um, how might the reliance of APA on DSM publication revenues affect the way that constructs in psychiatry are developed and formed? And I want to argue that there's no objective or politically neutral way to frame these kinds of questions. These are both empirical and political questions, both questions of fact and of value, not one or the other. All we can say is that the DSM is likely to display both the virtues and also the vulnerabilities of the community which originated it, which is American psychiatry for the most part, and the communities which continue to use it and to confer value on it. So this leads, as I begin to conclude, back to Thomas and John. Uh, does anyone want to guess who Thomas is? These are both actually real, real people. Thomas is the depressed lawyer. Any guesses? Jefferson. Not, see, I knew somebody was going to say It's not Jefferson, but you're, you're not too far off, actually. So, I didn't use actually his, I used his father's name, I thought his first, his real first name, I give it away. It's uh, mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln. Um, Lincoln is well known to have been melancholic. Uh, he had at least twice in his early political career uh, periods, always in response to stresses of various sorts, which would almost certainly today be diagnosed as major depressive episodes. Uh, in 1835, after his first depressive episode, uh, and the, close of a, the death of a close friend named Ann Rutledge, he, uh, he contemplated suicide. His friends were so worried about him at a small town in Illinois that they, they watched him. Uh, he actually stayed a week or two with a local justice of the peace and his wife basically being cared for. He was kind of unable to function during that time. And he eventually emerged from it. And in 1841, he had a second and more severe depressive episode, also in the context of a lot of professional stress and the moving away of a close male friend that had gotten married and moved to Kentucky. And uh, at that point, he actually it, it sought the care of a local physician who we don't know exactly what happened in the context of that care, but probably involved a number of biological treatments. He wrote a letter at that point that said, among other things, I'm the most miserable man alive. And if you read his writings about that point, they're quite dark, and they convey much of what we understand uh, now, and, or what we call now, depression. The question is, is it really helpful to think of Lincoln through the lens of the modern DSM? Joshua Wolf Schenk has written a book about 10 years ago called Lincoln's Melancholy, in which he argues that Lincoln certainly was melancholic and certainly was depressed. But at the same time, Lincoln lived in a time in the early 19th century where melancholy, which would have been the term that was used and was used by him and by others at the time to describe what was happening to him, was not understood just as a disability to be medicated away, but was understood as a kind of source of moral wisdom and a kind of a clear insight about the world, what we see sometimes now in debates about depressive realism nowadays. And Schenck argues that Lincoln's melancholy was not, it wasn't, it wasn't something an obstacle to his career and to his happiness and to his life, but it was also a source of energy that formed him to be the kind of leader who was capable of doing what he did in the 1850s and 1860s. Schenck says Lincoln did suffer from what we call depression as modern clinicians using the standard diagnostic criteria uniformly agree. But this diagnosis is only the beginning of a story about how Lincoln wrestled with mental demons and where it led him. Diagnosis, after all, seeks to assess a patient at just a moment in time with the aim of treatment. But Lincoln's melancholy is part of a whole life story. Exploring it can help us see that life more clearly and discern its lessons. In a sense, what needs treatment is our own narrow ideas of depression as an exclusively medical ailment that must be and will be squashed. Of therapy as a thing dispensed only by professionals and measured only by a reduction of pain. And finally, of mental trials as a flaw in character and disqualification for leadership. And that leads to John. Does anybody guess who John is? Not Jefferson. 
If I could have found a mental disorder with Douglas Thomas Jefferson, then I would have that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe y'all can help me get it. Any guesses? So John actually uh, is this person's first name. Uh, he's better known though by his nickname, which was Frenchy, or in uh, Italian at the time, Francesco, or for us in English, uh, Francis. Uh, his full name was uh, Giovanni Francesco Bernardoni. Um, before he became St. Francis of Assisi, he was, a 22, he was a young man, the son of a very prominent merchant in his town in Assisi, who, um, in a war that was defending the economic interests of his father and, and his father's business partners, went to a, a, participate in a local but very brutal war between Assisi and Perugia in Italy. He was uh, part of a brutal battle called the Battle of Calistrata Bridge. He was taken captive as a POW. He spent a year in a Perugian prison. He emerged a, a scarred man. He came back to his hometown and he was angry. And he actually went, did go back to combat briefly and then came back and gave his armor away. He sought the care of a physician who was supportive. But Francis' story doesn't end there. Francis came to understand himself through a series of spiritual experiences as called to follow not the, the lords that he followed in battle, but a different lord. And in this case, uh, Jesus, who spoke to him in the church of San Damiano. And Francis gathered together with other combat veterans, some of them from Assisi and some from Perugia and from those that he was fighting against. These combat vets who knew what it was like to be under command banded together under a different kind of command with a different kind of order, one of poverty and obedience and service. And they called themselves the Lesser Brothers, what were the Friars Minor, what we know as the Franciscan movement, which actually changed the face of Western culture and civilization. But it began in his deep experience of, of being wounded after battle and after combat. And this, this is a story that uh, my former student at Duke, Jeff Matzler, as a military chaplain, uh, helped me to see and to uncover. It actually remarkably opens up the experience of combat vets in a way that, that sometimes our, our modern medical understandings don't always do. So how do we understand this? And with this I conclude. Uh, I give these examples not as a way to valorize mental illness, nor to suggest that everyone with major depression or PTSD could turn out to be a Lincoln or a St. Francis, but simply to point out that psychiatric diagnosis is a moral enterprise. And those of us that are charged with providing language or concepts to describe unwanted experience and behavior, to walk with those that are suffering, bear a heavy moral burden in doing so. It's important to prefer and to choose and to seek for language that expands imagination, that leads to agency, and that leads to freedom. And sometimes the DSM does this. All of us that are clinicians have had time when, when recognizing a certain DSM category is making sense seems to fit. But sometimes it doesn't. And if the DSM makes it impossible for us to see melancholy as a source of potential wisdom, or post-traumatic suffering as a source of prophetic witness, for example, then the DSM begins to get in the way. The secret of using DSM well is to understand it for what it is, as a particular set of languages and practice that reflect the best understanding in a particular cultural context, the particular community of American psychiatrists. Not to expect it to be a timeless encyclopedia that carves nature at its joints, but rather to celebrate it as the contingent, tentative, political, scientific document that it is. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for taking a step back and showing us this document and telling a story that may potentially be somewhat therapeutic to some of the debate that's been going on. Um, we have time for your comments and questions. Um, there's another mic over there, and we'll bring you the mic. So um, I gather there are some folks with things to say. I'm John Lofty. I came here for an internship in 97 to study psychology, and et cetera, et cetera. I, there's a parallel in the DSMs you showed us, the green. We all talk, talk about the green card. It's no longer green, it keeps changing colors. And I saw you went from green, and then I carried around the maroon version. And uh, now it's gone to black. And it seems to me that the DSM is just getting increasingly black. It was my impression then. It's, uh, I remember looking through, trying to find some positive things. And then the DSM-3, et cetera, 4, it, suggested there are defense mechanisms, and then it, the only positive thing I could find is it said, of course there are some positive defense mechanisms, parens, e.g. humor. And that was it. And it was before, now, it was too early, because now psychology, the other APA is looking a little bit at least at positive psychology, 
Is there going to be any effort to come up with, we've got a black hat, is there going to be a white hat version of psychiatry someday? Uh, that's an interesting question, specifically about whether DSM can focus on flourishing rather than just on illness. And there, certainly there's movement within psychiatry now about 15 years after psychology uh, embarked on positive psychology to think about uh, psychiatry in relationship to flourishing. The APA meeting this last year was on positive psychiatry with this theme. So the answer is maybe. It's hard to see how DSM would, would do that, but, but I think that's part of, you know, the, part of the problem with DSM is not the text itself, but the way that it's used as a kind of encyclopedic text by the field. And if it um, were not forced to play that role, then it would give rise to possibilities that you just kind of. Hi, my name is my name is Dallas Ducart, and I'm a fourth year at the university. Um, my question was: You said that uh, McIntyre had desired that this moral language become closer to the communities, if I'm not mistaken. Um, do you see that the DSM, which is founded upon somewhat traditional and political American values as well, could be something that's applied to communities around the world, or should they be developing their own, you know, uh, DSM that is from their community, their traditions, and their stories? Yeah, it's a huge debate about how cross-culturally valid the DSM is, uh, and there's lots of literature about this that I could, could point you to. Uh, the DSM has traditionally taken syndromes which were understood to be contextualized in a particular culture and put them in a, a separate category called culture-bound syndromes, or in DSM-5 it's called something different, culture, cultural idioms of distress. Um, but the, the core DSM constructs have been understood to be potentially cross-cultural, with maybe some different prevalence in different cultures. And I think that's a, that's a criticism which uh, has not been resolved, except that I think it's, I would say for myself that the DSM um, uh, needs for political reasons to be cross-culturally valid, but uh, therefore has lots of incentive to overestimate the degree to which it is. And so the development of, of more local ways of describing uh, mental illness is something that different systems in different places uh, need to be attending to. But again, it's not an all or nothing thing. It's not that it's not just because things might show up differently in a different context that the the, the compendium understanding of the DSM is no longer valid. It might be for some things and not for others, or in certain cases and not for others. So it's a there's not an all or there's not a yes or no answer to that. I think it's a it's a need to kind of get more into the into the grass in terms of looking at how specific things evolve in different places. Uh, I'm Melissa Elliott. I'm a family therapist and nurse on the psych unit. And I have an idea that the way that you contextualize and think about this influences what you say when you're talking with a patient who has a new diagnosis. And I wonder how you speak with them about the diagnosis and back up and contextualize it. I imagine you teach this way too, so tell us. My, um my primary clinical work is at the Durham VA hospital, so I work a lot with veterans, so PTSD is something that I deal with a lot. And I've seen ways that P the diagnosis of PTSD can be quite liberating. Uh, when I was trained as a resident, I was taught in a very kind of mechanical way. You see the symptoms, you diagnose PTSD, you start somebody on an SSRI, you send them on to, to you know, a mental clinic appointment. Really, I mean, you could have trained them, but I mean, it's not, it's not bad, but it, 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 it wasn't a particularly complex way of thinking about initial ways to encounter people with PTSD. So nowadays, um, when I encounter people, when I'm in the process of speaking with somebody who might not have heard of PTSD or might have heard of it but not have much of a sense of it, I'll, um, I'll describe, uh, I'll, I'll hear that somebody has this set of inchoate, confusing experiences, uh, might not know what it's attributable to, and I'll, and I'll say, well, there, you know, there's, this, there's this set of experiences that we call PTSD that people who manifest this tend to have these kinds of experiences. They tend not to sleep well, they tend to um, maybe have dreams when they don't. Um, when they don't, you know, when they want to, they tend to avoid situations that remind them of things that have happened before. And I'll, I'll go on, you know, in a way that's contextual to the patient's experience. And then I'll look for a glimmer of recognition. And often it's a really profound thing. They're like, wow, you're, you're like, you're, you're naming my experience. And all I'm doing is just to basically say, you're not alone. There's other people that are able to experience this as well. And you can now talk to, and you can now have a set of concepts to know that you're not alone. And you're not, um, you're not just um, yourself, um, you know, uh, uh, somebody who's unable to hold a job or unable to keep a relationship going. But there's this, there's this language that can help you. And that, and, that, and that way, I think the language of PTSD can be liberating. And so I want it to be such, you know. I want to use diagnosis in a way that's liberating in that way. But what I worry about is that when people begin to see PTSD as a, an explanation for their experience, then they come in 
like six months later and say, well, my PTSD is a lot worse now, or you know, my PT I, I need a I need higher dose of sertraline because it's not working because my PTSD is acting up. And I'll say, wait a minute, has diagnosis now is it continu is it continuing to be liberating, or is it now something that uh, is is interpreting one's experience in a way that actually is taking away one's capability for agency and for freedom and for the development of relationships and other kinds of things. And I don't, I don't mean to make a categorical answer one or the other about that, but I think in different cases it can work in different times. And that's what's hard. You need that kind of discernment. I mean, and, I mean, I'm preaching the choir, but you need that kind of discernment as a clinician to make those kinds of judgments. It's not the DSM terms that are, are hard. It's knowing how and when they're used in the life of a person that takes a lot of discernment. And I'm still learning that.